Welcome to Scotland's Gardens and our interviews with gardeners. Today we are with the one and only Frank Cohen at Humbidine in East Lothian. Uh, this is a, a beautiful woodland garden and I just can't wait to hear what Frank has to say to us. So Frank, what? how long have you been here? I came here in late 2008. And what brought you here? The challenge of creating another garden, particularly creating a woodland type garden, which I'd never done before. Why a woodland type garden? Mainly because I hadn't done it before. <laughs> I had previously gardened on the coast, I'd gardened in suburbia, and this was something very different. My previous gardens were largely flat. This is anything but. My previous gardens were relatively small. The last one was an acre. This one's just over two acres. This was also at a much higher elevation than the previous one, though I didn't realise that meant the season was shorter at both ends, significantly shorter at both ends. It was a challenge to do one more garden. Could you explain what the garden was like when you first arrived? There's been a house here since the late 1930s, but there really wasn't much by way of a garden other than some mature rhododendrons, trees and shrubs which had been planted in the interval. In terms of structure, there really wasn't anything. It was pretty overgrown, and most of what you will see today didn't exist as a garden, in that I realised, I knew I'd bought a two-acre site, but large chunks of it you couldn't actually get into because it was so heavily wooded and so steep. And behind the house itself was simply a line of Leylandii, and you might as well have put up a sign which said, here be, here be demons, here be, here be dragons. There was nothing there, so essentially it was starting from scratch. And how long did it take to get to, from when you first got here, to a stage that you felt you could start working on what you really wanted? Well, I didn't really know what I really wanted. It was very much a question of trial and error. I did set myself the goal that within five years I wanted to open under the Scotland's Garden Scheme. So I opened for the first time in 2013. And the garden has really, it has expanded. It's got bigger than I intended it ever to be. But it's been an awful lot of fun. Yeah, great. So here we are in what you call the, the Everyman Garden at Humbay Dean. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about it? Well, my partner Joan christened this Everyman, the Everyman Garden on the basis that while people mightn't be, relate terribly well to a two-acre garden, they could relate much more to a segment of it. And it happened to be the only bit of the garden which was fenced against the wildlife when I first came here. Okay. And it also, it had an overgrown pond at that stage, it had some quite nice mature conifers, and some nice flowering shrubs, but not a, not a lot else. And it gradually, as you can see, we've eliminated large parts of the lawn, we've created a vegetable plot with what I suppose are a form of raised beds, we've planted a lot of bulbs, we've created a nursery area, it's, on a, it's relatively level, so you don't have to climb any steps to get to it. Um, and it's of a scale that people could relate to. Okay, no, I understand that. So this is one part of the garden. How many parts of the garden do you actually have? Well, I, the garden is divided into either four or five areas in my head. There's, there's the Everymanic garden, which is this bit. Then there's what is called the top garden, which is the other side of Everyman's, which was the only part of the garden I really intended to develop when I first came here because it was not completely flat but it was tractable okay. and it wasn't overwhelmed by brambles and nettles and saplings and all the rest of it. And then I started developing the woodland garden and that grew arms and legs and then the meadow behind us which is now a sea of daffodils had a very large Atlantic cedar in it, which came down in a storm, and suddenly it opened up all sorts of possibilities. Um, that's really what the garden is at the moment. So, things like you're talking about the Atlantic cedar, were there any other things like that, any things that presented initial problems, that since you've been here for how many years is it? 13, going on 13. 13 years. Things have changed that have allowed you to, to progress the garden further. Well, the great landscaper in the sky has occasionally removed very large trees. 
and opened up possibilities that I would never have thought of. That's probably one of the reasons I started actually creating the woodland walk down there. Yeah. And I suppose I've also developed skills over the years, in particular with in using a chainsaw. <laughs> and it's the first time in my life I feel I'm gardening without doing huge violence to the landscape. It's the first time I feel, I've felt, that I can actually read the contours of the land in such a way that I can plant it up that it gives me, it gives me a lot of pleasure. And I've achieved the goal which I had of providing interest round of, for a very, very long period. There's interest here, I would say, for 10 months of the year. Yeah. From a mixture of foliage, bark, bulbs. Um, I remember uh, a few years ago, you mentioned to me about your interest in foliage plants. Is that still the case now? Yes, it is. I think they're very. I think people. Not I think people. I think a lot of gardeners very much underestimate the benefit of having variegated foliage in a garden, and or, and of having particularly variegated foliage, which may go along with coloured bark in winter. So as we came, as you and I walked down here, we were looking at the Cornus midwinter fire, the the dogwood, the, the one of the dogwoods, and on its own, it's quite an unremarkable tree. But in the middle of winter, you have these vibrant yellow, pink, orange stems just looking out in, in, in the bleak midwinter. You've got variegated hollies, you've got pyrus, which, has, again, we walked past, has been providing colour for about four months now. The scent is wonderful today. And it, I was going to say the scent is wonderful. And it will produce red bracts going on. Um, you've got the skimmias, you've got the, the, there's, there's a variegated pyrus over there whose flowers are insignificant, but again it's evergreen and provides colour throughout the period. There's the, um, what do you call it, the, um, ugh, give me, the white stemmed silver birch, Jack Montiai, the Jack Montiai. Yeah. There's the, the willow, the, the, red, the red stemmed willow, there's the dark black stems of the willow here. Throughout the whole 12 months you've got this. They stand out much, much more in winter when the countryside is bare, the garden is bare, but even in summer they provide a contrast. I think that's a great reason to have lots of different foliage. Yeah, it is. Foliage, foliage and bark. They're as important in the garden as flowers, in my opinion. Okay. Yep. Okay, so here we are in the meadow at Humbidin. Frank, what happened? <laughs> Not what happened wasn't what was originally planned. When I first came here, this space was dominated by a large Atlantic cedar, which was a beautiful tree. Other than in midwinter, when everything else was bare, and you had this wonderful grey conifer, very, very large, standing in the middle of the meadow, looking as if to say, what am I doing here? And then a storm took it out, which was quite fortuitous. And on this side, the canopy was much, much closer in. It probably encroached almost from where we are now. So once the cedar came down I took the canopy back, my original idea was to create a wildflower meadow. Um, somebody told the deer and anything I planted, hundreds of plugs of wildflowers, <laughs> anything slightly out of the ordinary, the deer immediately found and devoured. So instead I changed the plan, which was to build on the very extensive collection of daffodils, some dating back to the 1930s, which were in this area originally, by selectively adding others, both to bring the season, start of the season forward, but also to extend it, and by putting in large amounts of camassia, which interestingly the deer don't touch. So that's the meadow. Um, it, the daffodils are followed by bluebells, yeah. and then the meadow is mown at the typically Six, not typically, the meadow is mown six weeks after the last daffodil flowers and then is mown only once a month throughout the rest of the season and that has got rid of most of the coarse weeds which were here. And that's the meadow. It does look absolutely spectacular this time of year and I'm looking forward to seeing it again in a couple of months time. But looking at, you're talking about the cedar coming down and Going back to how we talked about an overall vision for the garden, and do you actually have an idea of where you want the garden to go? 
No, I don't. I've never, ha I've never had an idea of where I wanted the garden to grow. I knew the sort of plants I wanted to grow. I knew that I was on acidic soil and I wanted to grow rhododendrons, azaleas, primulas, mechanopsis, the Himalayan blue poppies. These were the things I wanted to grow. And it was a question really of creating the conditions in which they would grow. So the cutting back of the, the, the coppicing, the removing of the saplings, the pushing back of the, the, the perimeter and so on has primarily been designed to create more space to grow the things I want. And then the network of paths and steps which has evolved hasn't had a plan. It's been guided really by the contours of the land, by whether there was a tree stump in the way or whether there was a rock in the way or a tree root. So some of the sets of steps wind rather round and they wind because they had to negotiate tree roots which were too large for my chainsaw. <laughs> but there wasn't a plan, no, there wasn't. So here we are in the woodland section to Humbidin and it's, it's so completely different to the rest of the garden. Frank. How did you make it happen? I didn't initially plan to make anything happen down here. And the again, the catalyst for doing so was that several large ash trees, you can see the stumps, came down in a storm about six, seven years ago. And I realized suddenly there was much more light than there'd been before. So with some judicious removal of other saplings, I was able to create a space in which rhododendrons, azaleas, pyrus, helibores, the stuff I like, would actually thrive. The main challenge was the slope. The gap from top to bottom is of the order of 30 metres. So steps had to be created, paths had to be created. Um, you just get on with it. You discover you can do quite interesting things with a hand winch and a chainsaw. The chainsaw is definitely something that I, I can see there's almost a passion for. <laughs> no, 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 there, no, there isn't. A, it's the tool that scares me most. But without it, I couldn't have done this stuff. And I'm a very, very poor delegator. If I can't actually do something myself, it won't get done. So the, con the main constraint on how this garden has developed has been, can I actually do it myself? One thing that, I, whenever I've been in this part of the garden, that always surprises me, because people uh, maybe associate woodland gardens with massive amounts of ferns. Mm. Is, uh, I'm, I'm impressed of what you've managed to get in here, which is colorful and flowering. Was there a reason you didn't go down the fern route? Ignorance on my part of ferns. I've, I've, I've had mixed success with some, with some ferns. The shuttle, shuttlecock fern, whose name I won't attempt to pronounce. I could try it, but I, I think I'd possibly fall into the river. Uh, you might. It, it worked well, but unless you rigorously thin it out, I find, you lose the shuttlecock effect. It just becomes one large, great, great mass. I've put in some other stag's horn ferns and various other things, but frankly, they don't, they don't float my boat. They haven't got interesting bark. They haven't got interesting coloured foliage. They, they don't do a lot. So one of the themes throughout all areas of this garden is that the palette of plants is relatively small. When I've found something that works well, I've looked for other members of the same family. So mm -hmm. when I've found primulas have done well, I've looked for other types of primula. When I've found perennial geraniums, which initially I introduced as an alternative to having to keep weeds under control. I just thought colonise with evergreen geraniums and discovered how versatile they were. Then I looked for others. What might be apparent on the, what you can hear here is there's a river running right by here. Did that present any problem? Other than falling into it occasionally, no. No, it didn't. You, further along there, you'll see we've had to construct a bridge, essentially to take us over what was the river, but the river has since changed course. So the bridge, the bridge is now an elevated walkway, rather than going over the river itself. No, the river hasn't presented any great challenges, no. One thing I will say about uh, this part of the garden is, as you come down the flights of stairs onto the path, it really feels like you're going on an adventure, which is something I absolutely love, and the bridge is a large part of that. I'm, I'm very glad to hear it. It's, it's the sort of garden in which grandchildren can get lost, which is wonderful, as long as they stick to the paths. Obviously. <laughs> so here we are uh, at the end of the tour in the top garden. 
Frank, why do you continue to love gardening? I like it because I can do it 365 days of the year and I'm constantly learning. And do you have any tips or hints for any gardener, new or old, who are thinking about starting a woodland garden? If you're going to grow stuff from seed, don't throw out the seed pot for at least three years. Some stuff takes that long to germinate. It took me a very long time to understand this. When you find something that does well in your space, look for other members of the same family. Don't concentrate purely on flowers. Remember the bark, the foliage, and the coloured berries you can get to extend the season. And don't plant one of everything. Go for a limited palette, plant three or five in a clump to make a statement, and when you find something that works well, look for other members of the same family. And finally, the dreaded question. What's your favourite flower in the garden? My favourite flower in the garden varies from month to month. At the moment it would probably be Pulmonaria Diana Clare, or it could be Primula Latior, or it could be Corydalis, George P. Baker, all three of which you can get in a single photograph there. Um, it's not a question I find easy to answer. No, no. But you've done fantastic, and I appreciate that. So that's us uh, for the tour of Humbe Din. Thank you, Frank, for all your knowledge, all your advice, and just telling us about your beautiful garden. Well, thank you, John. It's been a pleasure to take you around, and a pleasure to have shared it with you over the last eight years as it's evolved. And Thank I hope you. this video will encourage people to come and see it. So that's it. I hope this has given you a taste of what the garden at Humby Dean is like. It and many other similar gardens are all open this summer under Scotland's Garden Scheme, but please check the website first.